ball courts. That first one is reserved for us. And so it starts at 11 o'clock until we're done. Okay. And uh, so bring, uh, as you know, bring bring a meal for your family and extra to share with, with other people. There will be drinks supplied. Okay. The church will be bringing some, the drinks, uh, water and uh, soda pop and lots of ice and that. Um, and there will be grills with our own grill master there. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll be taking care of uh, any of the meat needs that you might have. Uh, there will be paper plates, and, the, and that, so you don't have to worry about that type, silverware types of things. Okay, any questions about, about the, the event tomorrow? Okay, now as a result of that too, we're not having reach tonight. Normally it'd be scheduled for tonight. With, with all that's taking place tomorrow, we're you can do your reaching tomorrow at 11 o'clock, okay? And, uh, but do bring your friends. This will be a great opportunity to introduce them to the church. Where is he? Welcome, William. We're glad that you can be with us. If you haven't met William, he's back in the corner there. And uh, make sure you get to, to meet him and uh, get to know him a little bit this morning. We're glad to have you with us this morning. Um, 
I have a card here. This was just given to me by John. So I will read that. Dear brothers and sisters, in response to the many messages of encouragement I received this week, thank you. I'm blessed by seeing so many of you growing, taking on new responsibilities and using your gifts to build up the body. Cindy and I are thankful for your support and glad to be part of the church. In Christ, John. Okay, that's from our brother John. Thank I'll put you. this up on the bulletin board. So. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> All you encouragers. All right. Um, two weeks from today, on the 11th, uh, we are having a guest speaker, uh, Hank Lawson, who represents the, uh, the Agape Village Foster Family Care. And so he'll be speaking both in the first hour in the, in the Bible class time and in the second hour as well. So look forward to that. And I think we're, gonna, we're hoping on having some uh, additional guests as well. I know Cindy has invited her office and, and others as well to come. And uh, anybody you'd like to have uh, that, that anybody, let me put it this way, anybody that likes kids, cares about children, <laughs> invite them. It's a great opportunity. Uh, I have personally met Hank, and uh, Penny and Rick know him as well. Uh, that was from many years ago, wasn't it, Penny? Um, oh, Janine knows. Before Rick and I were even married. Who are you pointing at, Paul? Janine knows him too. Oh, Janine knows him as well. Okay, well, yeah, he's well known then. Okay. He's from the other side of the tracks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's willing, he's willing to come over, cross over, and come over to our side. So we're real thankful for that. And. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, he's, he's from, from Nacapella Church. He's a great guy, and uh, he, he's a he's a kind of a fun guy. He's a, he's just a ball of energy. You know, he's he's older, but he's just got a lot of energy and, and kind of a fun person to listen to. So he has a great message he's going to be bringing, and uh, so please plan on being here for that. Afterwards, I, I see your hand, Cindy. Afterwards, we're going to have a luncheon. So plan on spending lunch time here. You can get to know him better and. Uh, and uh, so be here for that. And Cindy, what can you tell us about the luncheon? Oh, I'll have a sign up next week. There will be a sign up next week for the luncheon. Okay, so we're gonna do a little potluck here. And we'll, we'll just, we'll make areas here and we'll set up all the tables. And for people that don't know, Agape Villages is very active in the Manteca area. They have an office in Manteca and they do a lot in Manteca, which is why the Association of Realtors supports them every year. So, um, it's not just something that's in Sacramento or in the Bay Area. They're, they do a lot of good in the Manteca area. Okay. And even if you're not in a position to uh, adopt or foster a child, um, there are other ways in which you can be involved. And we're going to, in fact, in, in, uh, in just a minute, we're going to look at a very short video uh, of, of that work. Okay, and uh, about a two minute video. But before we do that, I'd also like to say happy birthday to our brother Silas. It's his birthday yeah, today. Amen. Jeff. So, because it's his birthday, we love him so dearly. Everybody, we're going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> All right, we're just going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Silas. Happy birthday to you. All right. Yeah. Um, pray for us next Saturday. Friday and Saturday, we're going to be down in the Watsonville area. Janine's cousin, Mike, is the only relative left, I guess, on the mom's side of the family. Um, his dad, uh, you knew we were gone a couple weeks ago, we were back and forth, uh, but they took him off life support. He had no brain function. They took a bad fall and ended up cutting off the oxygen to his brain, but we're going to do a gravesite on Friday and then uh, do a memorial service on Saturday. And I don't know if we're going to make it back or not. I'm not sure. It depends on what else is going on, how much support they need. But pray for us and pray for Mike and Cindy. Mike and Cindy. All right. 
we're going to open with a word of prayer right now, and then uh, then we're going to watch that uh, the short little video from Agape Family, Agape Village Foster Family Agency. One yes. thing everybody can do if you got an old car parked on your place you want to get rid of, call them up. Yes. You donate it, and they make money off of that. Okay. I, I imagine he'll be he'll be bringing some of that stuff. So if you can't, you know, if you even want to help out financially in any way, that's that's one method you could do. There's lots of ways in which you can give and help and support uh, orphans. That's what James tells us to do, isn't it? Yeah. Orphans and widows in their times of need. So that'd, that'd be a, it's a good cause. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for bringing us together, and uh, thank you for the joy that we can have in Christ. And uh, thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers so often and the good things that you've been doing uh, among all of us. And, Lord, we want to especially pray for uh, Mike and Cindy. Lord, we thank you for their lives, and we just pray that you would uh, comfort and console them in their time of loss. And I pray that you would help uh, Paul and Janine to be a good support as they spend time with them as well this next week. And uh, God, we just thank you that you are working among us, and I pray your blessing be upon us this, this during this service, and that uh, your word would just have a real effect in our lives. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. All right, we're going to watch about a two-minute portion of that video. My name's Jeff Dyer. I'm 19 years old, and I've been in the system since I was 17. I'm Paulina, and I'm 18. I went into Agape at 11 and came out adopted at 13. I live with my sister. Uh, my mom died when I was around 10, and um, my dad was uh, kind of stopped talking when I was like five. I don't know what agency I was in when I was four years old. I was heavily bullied by their children, and it was a very toxic environment for me because I had already felt left out where I would grew up. And uh, it was a rough time, but um, I'm glad where I am now. I found that through the events that Agave placed, they would have social events for the, you know, the kids in the program, and so I got to kind of talk to other kids, and yeah, it was a better experience because I got to interact with other foster kids, which made me feel less alone or less, uh, you know, like the only one, which often it feels like when you're in foster care. My name is Cheryl, Cheryl Youngblood, and I've been with Agape Villages now for six years this year. Our mission statement in Agape Villages is that every child deserves a family. We strive on always placing a child in a loving, stable home. I was kind of scared about the process. Um, I didn't know, you know, where to go, and um, but. I got into Agape and um, they found me like a home like a couple of days as soon as, as soon as I went out, of, went out of my house. They've been helpful so far and I'm pretty sure that they'll still help me along the way and so we're towards the very end. I've learned that what a difference a, a really stable, loving foster home can make to a child. I mean, it's amazing when you see especially a teen come into foster care and they're jaded and rightfully so, and they're angry and you know bitter, and uh, what a difference that stability and love and security can really make. I've seen some pretty tough kids come into foster care, and uh, what a difference it makes, you know. Um, when they are offered a loving family. Seeing some of the kids there and like listening to some of their stories and what they had been through really opened my eyes to like, wow, I've been through some of that stuff too and I can do some of the things that they've done. And I think Agape Villages has come a long way. I think we really pride ourselves in pioneering new programs. We're always working to better the agency. We have a really strong group of people. Everybody works really hard. We have a teen girls group now. We have several different programs. There's three essential things that anybody can do if they've even thought about helping out a foster family agency. First, there's being a foster parent. We're always looking for good, stable, hardworking people who are interested in taking care of children who need help. Secondly, there's donations. We're always looking for donations. You can donate, um, you know, 
funds, uh, you can donate gifts, whatever that you have that you feel that a child could need, clothing, whatever. And lastly, volunteers. Volunteers are essential. Anything that anybody is willing to volunteer their time, they can work a booth, they can pass out brochures. All I can say is if anybody's ever thought about doing anything for foster care or ever wondered what it is, please just give us a call. You can contact our website. There's always something that you can do to help a foster youth. Again, through being a foster parent, donating, or volunteering your time, we're always grateful for anything anybody's willing to do for us. Don and I have been dealing with <clears throat> Magape Villages for many years, even before we came to this uh, congregation, even before I think we even came to Manteca. And uh, I recall one little experience I had. The orphanage used to be up, what, around Fairfield area? They had an orphanage up there. And they were having a, a food drive. And, uh, okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry. They had a, <coughs> excuse me, a food drive uh, at this uh, church we were going to. And that food drive, they didn't have anybody really to take the food up. They didn't have somebody that had the availability at that time to have somebody do it. And so I volunteered and I took my little old Nissan pickup and loaded that thing to the gills. I mean, that was a load of canned goods that I'll never forget. And the drive was wet, rainy, cold day. But to know that there were going to be a lot of uh, children benefiting from the food that they donated was very pleasing to do that. It was a wonderful experience. And since then, we've been, uh, we've been working off and on with Agape Villages and uh, I suggest everybody look into them more because you may know somebody that might need to use them. You may find a child, somebody who needs them. Okay, at this time, if you'll turn into your books, number 633. Uh, I've not led this song before. I know pretty sure we've sung it before, but we're going to just uh, go ahead and do it. And if we know it well enough, we'll just go right through it. Uh, if you'll play through it one time. So 
22. I'm going to read verses uh, 22, 36 through 38. And that's Matthew 22, 36 through 38, before the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> and the question is given, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So I have a question for us to ponder. It's basically, do you believe that God lives within his creation? Something to think about. Some people find it difficult to the, that God actually lives and interacts within the physical elements of the universe. Are we familiar with Bette Midler? She had a famous song a while back. It's called From a Distance. I don't know 
know, some people might be familiar with it, some might not. But anyway, um, people kind of think like the song goes, they believe that God doesn't see the injustice and evil of mankind up close because he's far and removed from us. He sees things from a distance. Like a broken family, um, those people see him as a dad who only has visitation rights a few hours, one day per week, on Sundays. He never really sees the real us as we go through our real lives as we are on our best behavior for dad and his family, which would be the church. As if a distant, if a distant God is what you believe in, which I doubt it, but we know nothing could be further from the truth. God would never create life just to abandon it or to just to observe it far from a distance. God created everything so that he could demonstrate his love for us. And he wants our genuine love and undivided attention in return. Genuine love is not something that's pressured out of someone and it cannot be coerced. Genuine love has to be given with a free will and it has to come from the heart. Our greatest commandment from God is to love the Lord with all our heart and just as he seeks a personal relationship from us, we must seek him and love him above everything else. <laughs> Doing this requires our personal sacrifice. God knows about sacrifice. He sent his first son to earth to die on the cross for our sins. Christ sacrifice, or Christ sacrificed everything. He left the glories of heaven. He lived a humble life and he died a disgraceful death on the cross for us. He was a blameless lamb that was sacrificed for the remission of our sins, not his. Through his sacrifice, Christ showed us on the cross um, without question that he loved us. And I think we can all agree about that. So it's something to think about before we take communion. <clears throat> Thank you. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you now uh, remembering uh, the, the great sacrifice where you showed that not only did you care about us, but you loved us unconditionally. And uh, not, all you ask in return is that we love you unconditionally and give our lives to you. Lord, we thank you so much for the son, the only man who ever knew no sin, to, that he uh, he died. His, his body was nailed to a cross, humiliating death, to show exactly how much you loved us. And Lord, we thank you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Father, it's uh, something that... It's humbling to realize that even though you are far above us and beyond us, that you had a plan from the very beginning to come near to us. God, that because Jesus came and lived among us and walked with us and experienced the things that we we experience every day, that we can come near now to your table 
and to partake together. It's something that draws us closer to each other, but closer to you as well. And God, we're, we're just thankful with everything that we have, that you don't stand from afar and, and not engage with us, but that you encourage us to come around the table each and every Sunday, partake of the bread and the cup, to remind us of the sacrifice that you made by sending Jesus to our earth. God, I pray that you'll help us to be <clears throat> affected by this, not just right now, but, but through the week, that, that this can be a time we look back on and that our lives will be different as a result. Pray these things in Jesus' name. If you'll mark in your songbooks uh, for closing song number 420, and uh, Brother John. Thank you, Jeff, for the music today. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben. Rick, for your good thoughts. Welcome everybody, glad you're here. I'm uh, happy to speak to you this morning from the book of Philippians, <coughs> chapter 3. If you could open your Bibles there, Philippians chapter 3. this morning is that we have a choice to rejoice. Um, you know, sometimes we think rejoicing is simply a matter of um, just whatever the circumstances are might be going on that day, you know. Um, if there's something great going on, I'll rejoice, and if not, I'll, uh, I'll mourn. <laughs> I'll be sad. I want to read this... Uh, 
First verse. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard to you. By again, he means that he's already talked about this quite a bit. Read the book of Philippians. Did you read the book of Philippians this week? It went by pretty fast, didn't it? I think that was Friday. Boom. <laughs> Philippians. Done. Um, but you see this word popping up over and over again. Rejoice. Uh, you know, we all rejoice in something. And you might think that's, well, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not one of those rejoicey kind of people, you know. I'm kind of a very sober, somber kind of person. But, um, you know, whether we have a bubbly, upbeat personality, or if we're quiet as a mouse, or if we're downright sad, we all rejoice in something. <clears throat> it's that something or someone which holds our interests. And that's what we rejoice in. They're the thing that draws our attention. The thing that gets the lion's share of our time and our devotion. We can look at it that way and say that's, that's really what you're rejoicing in, regardless of what, the, what your personality is or anything like that. You know, it's what we talk about when conversation becomes general. <laughs> you ever notice that? Uh, when, you know, things are dismissed and there's a, the volume level goes up and pff, everybody just starts talking away. What do you talk about? We talk about the things that are important to you, the things that uh, you think are great. Um, it's also what we ruminate on in our beds, you know, uh, in the wee hours of the night. Um, the thing that occupies our, our thoughts. Usually our family and friends can name whatever it is we rejoice over. Would you say that's true? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, what, uh, what animates us? What gives us joy and satisfaction? Um, do we know ourselves? Do you really know what makes you tick? What you rejoice over? It might surprise you. Um, you know, would our answer be the same as that of an outside observer? Uh, about what we rejoice in. Would we say family, but, but um, maybe our, our, our fellow workers would say it's, it's football, definitely football. <laughs> okay. Um, or um, do we feel like we delight in being responsible? Whereas maybe others around us just see it, you know, this guy seems to be preoccupied with money. You know, that's, that's what drives his life, it's money. Okay. See, this passage is not really, it's not really an antidote for someone having a sad time in life or a blue Monday. Uh, it's not even, I don't believe it's even an encouragement necessarily to lift up the spirits of Christians who were, who were suffering the nightmare of persecution. Um, see, the choice here is not between rejoicing and not rejoicing. It's rather about the object of our rejoicing. Will it be the Lord? Or will it be something or someone else? I want to read verses 2 through 7, and he talks here about uh, a deceptive substitute for, for what God has in mind for us to rejoice over. He says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. <clears throat> kind of interesting. These are the very terms that, that the Jews often used about Gentiles. But Paul's flipping it around and, and mm -hmm. saying, you need to watch out. Um, there's some folks who are trying to bring something back uh, that we've already moved on from. They're trying to bring the law back. They're trying to bring, bring back Judaism. He says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, 
by far more. This kind of reminds me of Paul's, <laughs> Paul's uh, on purpose bragging about his, uh, his exploits and his sufferings. It's, uh, when he says, you know, I speak as if one insane. <laughs> and so he says, well, you know, if you want to talk about the flesh, if you want to talk about the, the great things of this world, um, yeah, I, I, I had a few. Um, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were given to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You know, Paul kind of had it made, didn't he? In terms of religious, religious connections, Paul had it made. You know, having it made means a person has every advantage in life, right? Um, an influential family, distinguished ancestors, um, born with a bank account. Yeah, he was. Um, and these things, these are things over which we have no control. It, it's just uh, fortune, <laughs> good fortune, I guess. Um, some do, some don't. There's no fault or credit either way. Um, some do squander wonderful opportunities like these, wasting all their resources on worthless pursuits. Others, like Paul, are born with a lot, and they do a lot uh, with what they have. They add effort and diligence to their inherited blessings. So Paul, what did he do to his pedigree? You know, we use that about humans sometimes. Uh, to his, his background, he added years of study and deep devotion to the law, to religious tradition. And he even carried it so far as having a burning desire to fight anyone who dared to insult God or, uh, or oppose what he believed. This was a man who used his advantages to the fullest. And he put his heart into what he did. And so um, Paul was a rising star, already on his way to greatness. He was well known. You know, in spite of everything that Paul had started with and everything that he accomplished, you know, something was wrong. Something was missing. And so um, Jesus had a conversation with Paul. You know, unlike many people who say, hey, the Lord spoke to me, <laughs> Paul could say, the Lord spoke to me. And, uh, but, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't all roses. The Lord said to Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? You know, that, that refers to when you drive animals with a cart or a wagon or something. You, you poke them, you flick them on the rump with a, a switch or something uh, to get them going, you know. And, Paul, and Jesus says to Paul, why, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you doing this? Get away from me, God. I don't like that. Um, I think maybe it was Paul's conscience. You know, uh, seeing a Stephen die and, and saying, God, forgive these people. Uh, that could have been goading Paul in, on his interior quite a bit. But anyway, you know, he, something wasn't right. And, and God acknowledges that. You're, you're fighting me, Paul, Saul. Um, but when he was confronted with Christ, Paul knew, this is it. It's not even an it, it's a who. Jesus is what I need in my life. More than all that other stuff, all, the, all that uh, reputation and all those accomplishments and everything that I had, Jesus is what I need. That's why he can say what we've just read Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
You know, Paul, I think Paul could relate very deeply to Jesus' parable about the, uh, the pearl of great price. Remember that one? There was a pearl dealer, a, a, a merchant, a, a jeweler, you could say. And somewhere in the market or, or in his buyings and sellings, he sees this pearl and uh, apparently the owner doesn't really realize how great it is. But this pearl is the perfect specimen. And so what, is that, uh, what does that pearl merchant do? He steals it, right? No. What did he do? Sold it. He goes and sells everything he has. His wife says, what are you doing? <laughs> are you crazy? Uh, you're risking, you're gambling everything on this one deal. He says, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll see. And he goes and he buys that pearl. And lo and behold, he's right. It was worth way more than what he paid for it. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like that. We have a lot of stuff. We've accomplished some things. We, we, uh, we've been blessed. We get, we get a reputation, a good one. And um, sometimes we have to say, well, I'm gonna put all that on the line because I gotta go with Jesus. No matter what all these people think, I, I'm gonna do that. And I realize uh, that is like nothing. See, Paul did some spiritual accounting. You know, he, he, he he rang it all up and he totaled it all up. He had three days <laughs> between the time he talked to Jesus and there was a man came to his house named Ananias. He said, Paul, what are you doing? You need to get up and wash away your sins. Uh, God has work for you to do. And so he had the answer by the time Ananias came and it was yes. This was, no, this was no idle calculation. This was no mental exercise of, well, yeah, you know, pros and cons. Um, it was more like, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Like Joshua said, you're going to have to either choose. It's, it's either Jehovah or the gods of the Amorites or the, the ones you brought from Egypt. You're going to have to make a choice. And Paul knew that. And he said, yes, it's going to be Jesus. You know, and so after he, sh what did he do then? Well, he got his sight back, and he headed down, and it says he went to the synagogues around Damascus, and he immediately declared Jesus as the Christ. He had gone there with letters, <laughs> to with authority to arrest any followers of the way. That's what they call it, the way, and put them in chains and drag them back to Jerusalem for punishment, prosecution, whatever. He goes down to the synagogues and says, got news for you. <laughs> this is news. This is a flash bulletin. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And uh, there was quite a stir. It says he confounded the Jews. They had no answer. They, they couldn't... They couldn't... Uh, Arguing him down. And proving from the scriptures, of course, that Jesus is the Christ. You know, it, it says it took many, after many days. How, how long is that? Well, maybe a few weeks. Doesn't say many weeks. Doesn't say months. Many days. A few weeks later, his old life was gone. That decision he had just made turned out to be a very monumental decision. The golden boy of the Pharisees. The point man in the war against Jesus and his followers. Against this, what did they call it? This heresy. This sect. This great star was now a, a wanted man. He escaped out of a walled city 
uh, in this thrilling adventure, if you want to call it that, of being let down over the wall or through the wall in a bas big basket and running for his life. Wouldn't that be a thrill? Could you imagine that? That was my life. I came here, I came here with authority, with respect, with uh, a future ahead. I'm leaving here with my life and the clothes I have on my back. That's quite a decision, isn't it? Gone were the lectures at Gamaliel's school as a, as a former student. The meetings of the Sanhedrin, the respectful greetings in Jerusalem of the, the priests and the scribes, the approval of his family. How do you explain that to death? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. What they had invested, <coughs> time, money, trouble. You're doing what, son? got to be kidding me. Those were gone. So what he says next is even more powerful. There, there is a treasure. It's a true treasure. That is Jesus, point number two. More than that, I count all things to be loss. Not just the things I used to have, but I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. You know, today, right here among us in our lives, many things are clamoring for our attention and our devotion right now. trying to win, or, or say, maybe say win back our affection and really <coughs> cloud our judgment in terms of what is, <coughs> what is truly <coughs> worthwhile. Some things are good. Some things are worthless. But none compare with Christ who is, uh, he says, of surpassing value. So rejoice in the Lord, not things. You know, Paul here has no buyer's remorse. Sometimes I hear on the radio, car dealers, you know, give you three days. You don't have to do that buyer's remorse thing and say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't want that. It's not a good deal. Or I, Paul says, I have no regrets whatsoever. <coughs> None at all. I made the right choice. By comparison, this is not just better, it's what I used to have is of zero value, and Christ is a treasure. You know, oftentimes there's, I go to the dump a lot, and there's a sign at the dump, you know, where you put your stuff. You know what it says? You ever, you ever go there? Maybe you can read this. Jason's blue tape. No salvaging. What does that mean? Do some people go there to pick up stuff <laughs> and not drop stuff off? Well, um, you know, what it means is there's no rummaging you know, among the trash piles for, for uh, the piles of trash and waste and filth and debris and tear out stuff from people's remodels and all that, um, looking for some kind of a treat or a treasure to take home. It's hard to do that where I go because you'd have to jump down and, and uh, there's a tractor coming around to <laughs> get a squash you. But other places, you know, like I know up in South Lake Tahoe, you just, just back in here and, uh, well, there's people out there. Wow, well, look at that. <laughs> I'm going to take that home. Um, yeah, 
the, the whole idea is just, just leave it there. Don't, don't go poking around in there. Why is Paul going over these points with the Philippians anyway? You know, he had already known. He says, I, I want to know Christ. Well, didn't he already know Christ? Yeah, he did. He says, I want to, uh, I want to gain Christ. I want to be found in Christ. I want to understand what it means to share Jesus' sufferings. Yeah, he'd already done all that. And so had his, his listeners. They had done that. They had, they had given up things for Jesus too. So that's what he's doing. He's putting up this, this no salvaging sign. Leave that stuff. That stuff that you tossed out, you know, five years ago and said, this is, this is killing me. This is hurting me. This is, uh, this is destroying me. He says, you are right. Don't go back and pick it up off the trash heap. Don't, don't try to salvage that. Even... Even those great times when we used to make all that money and have all that fun. No. It says what we need to do is we need to rejoice and revel and celebrate and enjoy and marvel at the precious blessing of knowing Jesus Christ. None of that other stuff compares in, in any way. We're set free from the power of sin. And, and we're setting our sights on greater things, on resurrection <coughs> and eternal life. <coughs> Point number three, don't look back. Kind of goes right along with no salvaging. Don't look back, reach forward. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained it, or I've already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, I might say mature. Have this attitude. And if anything, if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. You know, in the Bible, looking back is not really a good thing, is it? <coughs> Remember Lot's wife? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of lived out in a physical sense. He said, don't look back. She looked back. She was turned into a pillar of salt. She became a mineral deposit. The children of Israel spent 40 years in the desert. What were they doing? Oh, if we could only have those, those honeydew melons, those shallots, those leeks, those onions, all that good stuff. 400 years of slavery was boiled down into a Man, I wish I had my garden back. I want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> really? You really? Is that what you want? That's insane. Uh, that's, not, that's not a good trade. Looking back is not good. Jesus said, anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because, well, that's, <laughs> that's where we go when we follow our face, you know? And if we look back, we're going to go back. Okay? So don't look back. Reach forward. Now there, in this process of learning to rejoice in the Lord, you know, we, we, can, we can have some observable results. Number four, how is it working out? And, you know, Paul's not going to be a name-caller here. He's not disparaging people. He's saying, I want you to observe. Cause this is kind of like you do when your kids are little, you know. Um, your kids say, Mom, um, what's wrong with that guy? What, what's, what's happening with those people? It doesn't seem right. And we say, Son, um, they're making some bad choices, and it's not working out. It's, it's, it's turning out very poorly. 
do we despise those people? No, we don't. But but it's it's a teaching. What do they call that? A teachable moment, teaching opportunity. Paul says, I want you to look at some observable results. Two sides of a coin. One is <coughs> called the call of the wild. Verses 18 and 19. I'm skipping 17 for just a minute. This means rejoicing in the flesh, in the things of the world. And as he says, setting our mind on earthly things. He says this, for many walk, of whom I often told you. I think he's talking about people that he knew. People that had turned back. I, I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. You know, we, we can look at situations, we can look at people and say, well, um, I'm going to observe. Here's, here's some folks who are making a choice. How is that working out? That's what Paul's doing. And I think in his mind there's some, some faces and names on this because he says, I'm weeping about it. I'm not <coughs> condemning these people. I'm not, uh, I'm not acting like they're uh, somebody that I hate. I'm weeping about it. It distresses me to know that somebody has... Uh, tried to salvage those old treasures that they had thrown on the, on the trash heap. Number one, he says there's a, there's a tragic ending ahead. It's not going to end well at all. Who's, whose end is destruction. You know, and we see that, we, stack, we see it happening in two ways. We see it in happening in the terms of self-destruction as people destroy their own lives self-inflicted. And then what's wor- then it gets worse. We still have to face our Creator on the Judgment Day, whose end, whose final end, is destruction as well. Here's something else that happens when we answer the call of the wild, when we, when we want to rejoice in the things of this world. We're victims of desire. He says, whose God is their appetite? We live in an age of addiction, don't we? What was that definition you had yesterday for addiction, Cindy? It was like a habitual, uh, habitual indulgence in things that um, give us uh, our, our our own version of, of comfort. She's going to look it up again. I thought it was good. I, I should have written it down. But we live, we, we use the short, the short form, the shorthand is addiction. We're addicted to drugs, we're addicted to tobacco, to drinking, to sex, to excitement. You have people that are addicted to excitement. Ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. Ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. I like that. Addiction. Okay? We have, we have people who are addicted to excitement to the point where I will risk my life. We just lost another one up in the grape vineyards up there uh, outside of Lodi. Really? Is that worth it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Not, not when it doesn't work out well. We're addicted to entertainment. We're addicted to food. We're addicted to attention. And I think that's where a lot of social media is. Is uh, I need attention, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say stuff that will make people pay attention to me and acknowledge me. Um, is it evil? No, not necessarily. But um, we can att- attention can be a real addiction that we have. Paul indicates actually that what we're doing is we're worshiping self in all these cases. Does that sound weird? Whose God is their appetite? My, my God is my appetite. That's, that's who I'm serving, really, is, is me. I worship that feeling that's produced by my, my thing, whatever it is. And I'll go to the ends of the earth to feel it once more. I'll even kill for it or die for it myself just to get that buzz once more. 
that I from doing whatever I rejoice in. He also says this, and when, when we when we want to turn back, uh, he says, celebrating their shame. No, he doesn't say that. He says, whose glory is their shame. But I say celebrating. You know, our world's answer to guilt is stop feeling guilty. Well, that really solves it, doesn't it? Well, that's, that's, that's what's done, though. Just glorify it. Celebrate living a life of sin. We'll have a parade. Or, or a... a, a support group or something um, will publicize our own perversion and promote it as something good and positive and healthy and it'll set you free from all the all the shackles of traditional religion and so on. We'll even get major religious leaders to, to, uh, to come out in support of sinful lifestyles and pervert the script, stand the scriptures on their head so that right is wrong and, and wrong is right. Rather than be in the uncomfortable position of recognizing, hey, you know what? I'm out of step with God. <laughs> I'm, I'm not walking with God. Okay? So, so we do a lot of jockeying around to make that okay. Contrast that with the upward call. Verse 17 he says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Here's that thought again we're observing. Look what's going on. This is on the positive side. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So we are actually told, observe, take note of those who follow the pattern that, that you've been given. Think about the great women and men of God that you've known. Can you think of a couple? You know, it seems like they're graduating in droves now. <laughs> uh, that's probably because I'm getting older. And the people that I've known all my life, it seems like every week I hear about somebody. The one they went to be with the Lord. They're not. Uh, some have even been among us right here, some great people of God. What made them rejoice? What made them tick? What was their big thing in life? What was their focus? You know, we don't idolize or worship um, other Christians, but we can profit greatly by observing their example and the results of their lives. I think about Al. Mm -hmm. Think about Helen. Think about uh, Charlie. Think about Clarence. Think about Elliot. Think about Marion. I think about Marion. <laughs> <laughs> We've had two, two uh, evangelists here by the name of Marion at, at, at this small little church. Um, my dad was one. The other was Marion McKee. Uh, he has some real quality there. Some very dedicated people who, who lived Christianity in word and in deed. Okay? They, they said it, they, they, they believed it, and they lived it in great ways. Now, we need to observe those who walk according to the pattern. So we can do that. Also, according to what he says here, we need to have an alien mentality. We're aliens here. He says our citizenship is in heaven. Okay, that means this is temporary. This is not our final home. <coughs> this is not what it's all about. Not America, not Australia, not any other place on earth even. Um, it's about heaven. This is our temporary home. And he says this, and this is to close, eagerly, eager from which heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior. We're waiting for Christ. He's what it's all about. And what he will do to us. 
transforming mortals into immortals to be like him. Are you eager? Where's Tom today? <coughs> Miss him. <laughs> Tom's kind of eager for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't he? That's a great quality. He realizes uh, this, this is not what it's all about. I want Jesus to come back. Okay? Are you eager? Are you waiting? Are you ready to go? Those are questions. Those are serious questions that would uh, bear some thought. You know, it gets a little more exciting when when your body starts to deteriorate a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> you realize, uh, well, I hope this isn't what it's all about because I'm starting to fall apart. My warranty ran out and now stuff is falling off. <laughs> My bumper just, you know, and, and well, one day you go to read a book and I can't book. Oh, there it is. Okay, now I'm going to have to read like this. What's going on? Well, it's our bodies. Our bodies are decaying. And that accelerates as we go, doesn't it? And so that's a, that's a great... I think God probably meant it that way. So that we would start cluing in. This it's not all about here. There's something better. And uh, we need to set our hopes. Set, our, set our, our, our excitement level needs to be for heaven. You know, it's amazing to observe faithful, even eager sisters and brothers who are contemplating their departure from earth. Have you talked to any of those? Yeah. You know, uh, when my mom first realized she was ill, and she's, she's farther along now, she said, uh, well, you know, Dad and I, we always talked about tripping up the golden stairs together, but he got the jump on me. <laughs> you know, I just thought... This is, you know, me, me getting the news of uh, mom's dying. But her, her perspective was kind of, kind of chirpy, kind of cheerful. Um, I, he's not going to be that far ahead of me now. I'm, I'm getting packed. Okay. And what an example to observe those who, who follow that pattern, those who walk with this, with this mindset. No, going to be here for a few years. Our home is over there. And, and that's what it's all about. So I'm not going to invest too heavily. Why would I put everything I have into here and now when it's going to burn? It's going to burn up. It's going to get lost. Okay? I want to invest heavily in, the, in eternity. Jesus said, put your treasure in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We do need to do something with the, the wealth and the resources that we have here. But we can invest, believe it or not, you can invest physical wealth in spiritual uh, enterprises, the kingdom of God. So maybe that goes well with the job. <laughs> and any other, you know, missions and, and uh, preaching the gospel, all these things, um, they need... They need our stuff, you know. And, and we don't need it more than just enough to get to the end of our lives. So why not invest it in eternal things? I want to sing a song this morning to close. Number 420. And uh, the song says, Search me, O God. But like I say, sometimes sometimes we, we consider these questions and we say, Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I got that now. And then we think about, well, or do I? <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I need to take stock. Maybe I need to do what Paul did and, and do some spiritual accounting and say, okay, I'm going to do things differently from now on. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and not rejoice in the things of this world. No, 420, if you could find that and sing along.